Hi everyone, welcome to Metaphysical Mining. For this show, I'm joined by my friend and colleague, Dara Mason, the host of Spirit Box Podcast. The topic is author, explorer, and documentarian, Dushan Jersey, and his book, Faces in the Smoke. This book is featured throughout my paper and is a wealth of knowledge on the ways in which our ancestors understood how to combat the hidden predator. Uh, Dara and I discuss predatory terraforming of our planet as well as our human bodies, duality, storytelling, the holographic nature of reality, and principles of ancient sciences. Dara shares pictures from his trip to India and recounts a disturbing exchange while photographing the city of Jinns. I want to thank Dara for joining me. He was the perfect guest to help honor Dushan Jersey and one of my favorite books, Faces in the Smoke. Enjoy. We are here to talk about a book that I used in my master's. It's called Faces of the Smoke. The author's name is Dushan Gersi, and he is born in Czechoslovakia. He was raised in the Belgian Congo until his teens. And then he went back to Belgium with his family where he was educated by the Jesuits. He is a documentary filmmaker, international lecturer, actor, producer. He starred in a PBS miniseries called Explore. And the book that I used in the paper and what we're gonna talk about today is Faces in the Smoke, an eyewitness experience of voodoo, shamanism, psychic healing, and other amazing human powers. What I want everybody to remember as we're going through this is that this book was written in 1991. Some of the stuff that I'm going to be reading and referencing, just remember that it was that long ago that he wrote this and most of his experiences were what, back in the 60s and 70s? Yeah, some of that. Yes. Mm -hmm. And I have with me Dara Mason from the Spirit Box podcast. He also did a couple shows on this book, and I have them listed here. Explain to them about your show, the Patreon, and the shows that you did around this book, please. Yeah, thanks, Michelle. So I did kind of three shows, pulling out what I thought were some of the more interesting parts, certainly kind of the more, I guess, sensational parts Mm -hmm. in terms of subject matter, not in terms of how it's written for patrons who support the Spirit Box show. Just the kind of a remarkable material that Dushan witnessed as, as catalogued in Faces in the Smoke. Really remarkable stuff. Yeah, let's see. You talked about the zombies, which was in Haiti. I'm pretty sure, It is right? in Haiti. Yeah. The bulk of the stories that I recounted uh, were in Haiti. The first part in the introduction was in his childhood in Africa. Yeah, and then the flying men werewolves, screech owls, and vampires. That shows you the type of information that is provided within this book. It's incredible the experiences this man had over his career as a filmmaker and a documentarian. And if anyone wants access to these three, you did a three-part series, as I said, they're about, what, 30 minutes each? Yeah. And you read from the book as well as you gave a little commentary and they would go to your Patreon and I can put a link for that in the show notes as well. Cool. So then what I'm going to do on this show, they are completely different chapters. His Patreon, he goes into the introduction in chapter eight. I'm going to do chapter two, four, and nine. Between the two of us, you're going to get a really good understanding of the book and a lot of the book as well with us reading from it. Before I go to any more of the slides, what was it that you liked about this book? The reason why I'm asking is because for some reason, this book activated memories that I didn't even think I had. And I feel books like this are, they, they hold the voice of our ancestors. Mm -hmm. Um, These types of books and the things that you read about, it's like you remember things that you shouldn't remember. Because you're not part, you know, I wasn't from that part of the world that he was visiting and writing about, but something about it Mm. had a memory attached to it that was almost found in my blood and bones. And when I was reading it, it just activated it. Did you get a similar type of feeling when you were reading it? 
I love travel and I love exploration. That's what I, I did for a long time when I was a travel photographer. That was a passion for, for me. And equally, kind of my other passion is metaphysics, you know, mysteries of the spirit world. It's not often you get a, a, a really wonderful mix of those two things blended together. Also, Dushan was a filmmaker and photographer. So in terms of the language he spoke about having his kit with him, what he was talking about and his kit failing and all that kind of stuff, that was very very resonant in a deeply personal way from some of my experiences. So I so I enjoyed a lot of it from that perspective, you know. Um, and I also thought he wrote really well. I think my favourite part in all of it, the, the introduction is amazing. Like, it's really, yes. really amazing. And he does a really good way of setting out the book with this childhood experience that laid the foundation for him having a, a very different life. But I think my second favourite part in it is the part about the flying men that's absolutely extraordinary because he ties it together with european witchcraft and also the equivalent of flying men in papua new guinea with a tangible link which is extraordinary um and uh, do you want me to talk what that tangible link is i don't want to spoil the book no for anybody. go ahead go ahead because i as i was going through this to figure out what i was going to talk about i realized I could probably do a series of shows yeah. just on one paragraph within this book. I yeah. mean, this book is packed full of information from the occult to mm -hmm. religion to philosophy. He touches upon everything and, yeah. and he does such a great job of drilling down into a specific, you know, region and village. And yeah. it's just fascinating. And I'm glad you brought up your photography career because that's why mm -hmm. I wanted to have you on, you know, it's like, what, why did I pick you of, of anybody that I know to be on to yeah. talk about this? Because you reminded me of him as I was reading it, even the style of your yeah. writing is similar to his, but you've traveled just like he has, and you were a photographer. And we're yeah. going to get into that later. We're going to talk about yeah. an experience that you had that's similar to his, and I'm going to show some of your photos, but you're an award-winning photographer. Uh, so I don't, I don't know if a lot of people know that about you and I want everyone to know it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Michelle. Thank you. Yes. I've got a couple of, a couple of uh, awards under my belt. What I think one is from the Chinese Folklore Society in association yes. with UNESCO. And another one is the, an Asian travel photography accommodation and uh, British, British life photography awards. Uh, yeah, so yeah, I've, I've I've couple from my various adventures over yeah. the years. I don't ever hear you talking about that on your podcast. I wanted to give you the opportunity to do that because yeah. it's really the reason why I wanted to have you on to talk about this author, this explorer, and mm. also one of the main stories that I used in the paper is very similar to something that yeah. you experienced as well. But I did mm. cut you off. What did you wanted to talk about um, from the book that you really enjoyed? Well, it's this point around the, the flying men. Okay. Right. So when Dushan is describing what happens with the flying men, these people essentially dematerialize and materialize elsewhere. Um, so they only fly at night. And he describes, he said, he disappeared in front of my eyes, accompanied by a strange noise that sounded like large wings flapping in the air. And they call the flying men in Papua New Guinea cassowary men. A cassowary is a bird. It's a large quite dangerous bird but it looked like from behind that it resembled the feathers now he links this to the descriptions of when the flying men disappear as well they have a kind of a strange pattern behind them that looks similar but how he linked this really interestingly using the kind of the visual metaphor i'm just saying that well in europe in the middle ages witches were seen to fly brooms so were they doing the same thing from behind you know, like the Papua New Guineans have no visual reference for what a broom is in, the, in these rural areas. So that's what they're related to. So it to. would look like feathers to them. Yeah. Mm. And then, and equally, he makes this connection that perhaps in Arabia, when they think about the tassels on a flying carpet, is that an equivalent? So that this, gotcha. if you're, if, if what he's saying is a thing, uh, you know, which I think is highly possible, then if, if it exists in different pockets of the world, the description, the visual metaphor for what's happening is got a local reference. The yes. tassels on a, an Arabian flying carpet, tassels on a carpet, a broom or cassowary feathers. So, yeah, it was uh, really interesting. 
we could seriously go anywhere with this book. I tried to narrow it down to how I used it for the paper, but also how does this relate to the topic of the predator that I write about? And I pulled a bunch of quotes here that if you read them in the way I set these bullets out, if you follow this logic, you'll understand how the subtle predator terraforms not only us, the next slide will show how they terraform us, our human vessels, but how they terraform our society as a whole and how Carlos Castaneda and Pierre Sebeck talked about how they infiltrated our entire network of society and they built things up to benefit them, although it looks like it benefits us. Mm -hmm. So um, Dushan, he considered the subtle realities, which I would call the territory of the predator to be the domain of the shaman, sorcerers, medicine men, witch doctors and magicians among the peoples of tradition living outside the modern world within the third world or the fourth world societies. These designated members within many of the cultures around the world specifically trained to speak directly with and safely interact with the subtle invisible territories. Now that last sentence is very important. That is evident within the book and he picks all these different pockets throughout the planet on where those cultures are still to this day practicing that. Thank God, by the way. And then he talks about how as Westerners, we have come to accept the tenets of science which is almost a religion nowadays, that whatever cannot be experimentally proven must be false and that whatever cannot be explained rationally must be fake and that whatever cannot be duplicated in a lab must be sheer fraud. Now, why are we so dead set on that? I think it's because of this predatory terraforming. These predators can't come into our reality you know, as human, they're completely alien from us, but they do understand from a behavioral scientific standpoint, I think a very advanced one that we create our reality. So they use us as puppets. And the reason why we've gone away from this, you know, peoples of tradition type of thinking is because they've whispered in our ears all of these years to get us on this track of a way, you know, pointing us in a way in which it benefits them in the end. See, our jersey suggests that we carry within our minds the patterns of magical religious rituals and skills that have existed since we first evolved from the cosmic chaos. That information lives within our DNA and we pass it along through our blood and bones. And I think that this predator is trying to program us out of that information. But he goes on to say these patterns in our mystical truths, which have been passed on over generations through mythological storytelling may in fact reveal ancient happenings and powers that all of mankind across the planet used to perform. So people like you, Dara, that have these podcasts that read stories that use the voice of your ancestors is speaking through you, identifying specific things within your lineage to talk about, you're helping to maintain this, um, this safe way of interacting with the subtle and invisible territories. Even though this predator is terraforming us, I think that we're evolving to a point where we can use that which what they're using against us, we can flip it and we can level the playing field and take this technology that they're pushing us towards and use it against them. Your podcast, this show, um, you know, that's just two things, two examples of what I'm talking about, where we are trying to keep the, the peoples of tradition alive with communicating with the invisibles using supernatural powers, while we're still utilizing these computers, this technology age, this predator has influenced us to move towards technology, religion, and science those sectors in which they set up, it's their scaffolding in order to terraform this human civilization. And Jersey calls it brain atrophy. He says they've atrophied our brains to the point where we can't remember this magical religious rituals and skills that live in our blood and bones. I believe, this is my opinion, that the storytelling that we're continuing through this type of medium, this podcasting, this YouTube channeling, is something that's still activating these skills mm -hmm. that are within our DNA. Does that seem 
like a plausible argument or explanation. What the bit I particularly like there is your mentioning of storytelling, because I think people tend to get focused when we talk about metaphysical danger, when we talk about metaphysical challenges where mm -hmm. you come up against something or something seeks you out that <laughs> neither of those may be particularly pleasant or beneficial things uh, in the immediate sense. Um, but as you're describing that uh, terraforming of the individual and terraforming of society to benefit this spiritual predator, I think that the fact that you use storytelling as well as, say, those people who are expert and disciplined inside navigating the subtle worlds, right? So immediately you think of shamanism, but they can be as a whole range there, you know. The fact that you use storytellers is a deeply interesting thing to me personally, because I do believe that's true. I do believe kind of storytelling and to a wider extent, creativity are part of kind of the same thing. They're very similar in magic. A lot of magic is very performative, you yeah. know, so you could argue one's telling oneself a story to get you to that place. There's the use of music in shamanism and magic. But the other kind of Dursi quote you pulled out there talks about mythologies and having these arcs encoded in them, these narratives encoded in them it is absolutely true. If you look at even concepts like duality, you will have representations of good and evil. What seem to be at first glance evil things will also have in their name something that is the reverse of their appearance. For example, the Welsh king of the underworld, Gwyn Abnud, which I'm definitely not pronouncing correctly. Um, <laughs> You know, he appears as, as a dark man. He's seen as kind of like this dark creature. His name means bright, right? So it's like appears with darkness, but also means bright. Uh, and that's showing the duality in one, showing dark and light in one. We're getting to a big arc here for a boat, but, but what it's helping me do, looking at mythology and looking at, because that passion happens frequently. For example, in Irish lore, you have Dagada, who was one of the Tuna de Danann, and a couple of his kind of titles. Um, I can't remember the exact Irish. One of them is All Aher, which means All Father, which is very Odinistic, mm -hmm. and another one means kind of kind of burning, shining one, right? So you've got a figure that is kind of presented in in a kind of a dark way, kind of the a dark magician of the Tuna de Danann, but equally he'll have some sort of uh, appellation that refers to him as bright or shining or white so you have the dark and the white intertwined the two that's kind of demonstrating duality you know and part of all of these mythologies are often telling you in a obviously oblique way that um duality is an illusion that we are presented to in this world if you get through that and you realize black and white are the same which is a massive, massive concept. One that is very hard for us to get around because we live in a dualistic world. Yeah, and plus we're yeah. taught from a young age that there is a distinct difference. But then when you are put through what I call a predatory initiation, you know, what yeah. would the archetype of the predator puts you through an initiation. And I write about somebody like Jerry Marzinski, which you have interviewed. Yeah. He is somebody that went through that and then look at him. Mm -hmm. I would say that it was positive what happened yeah. to him, even though what's happening to his patients is mm -hmm. not always positive in the end. He's not able to help every mm -hmm. single one of them, but there can be that reverse of taking something negative and making it. Um, I don't know if I would call it positive, but it was, it, it transformative. Made, yeah, it was transformative. Thank you. Yeah. So I look at archetypes more than anything. That's what my ancestors mm -hmm. have taught me is looking at archetypal forces and how they work on the planet in general. And when you were talking about the storytelling, I try and look at podcasting and YouTubing and this type of new technology for us. It's new because our generation, mm -hmm. I didn't grow up with this stuff. So I mm -hmm. believe that it's the archetype of the shaman that is 
working with what it has to work with within this timeline and where we find ourselves right now. Like I'm not going to limit an archetype to what it can and cannot do mm-hmm. based on the time frame in which it's working on. These archetypes are evolving with us and you don't sit around at least I never did. You know, maybe when I was young, we would sit around a campfire and tell stories, but nobody has time for that, Dara. I mean, it's like nowadays people are working two you or gotta, three you jobs. You got to get the wood. You got to light a fire. Yeah. Find somewhere safe to light a fire. It's pretty yeah. inconvenient. <laughs> pretty inconvenient. And you know, and it's funny because um, you know we were just talking about wood burning stoves. So like I grew mm. up with a fireplace, but I've been around friends. They didn't even know how to start a fire. I'm like, how do you not know how to start a fire? That's such a basic yeah. thing that a human being should know how to do, but that's where we're at. These storytelling, I guess, scenarios, environments that we used to find ourselves in where an elder, your grandparents, yeah. your great grandparents would tell you stories that's gone. I mean, in certain areas of this planet, it's yeah. extinct. And so I think that's why the surge in somebody like a Joe Rogan podcast, where you would think three out, who the hell wants to listen to something for three hours? Who can Well, we're doing that because Mm -hmm. we're searching for that, that, you know, what I was talking about when I read this book, I had memories that were activated from this, where I'm like, how did, there's no way I would have known that from any Mm -hmm. of my family or the place, the geographic location I grew up in. And I think that's the archetype trying to really work itself through this technology. Um, do you agree with that? I would go along with that because I, I think, again, there's a recurrent pattern. Like uh, in the 90s, it was in comics. Yes. You had Grant Morrison, Alan Moore, you know, writing The Invisibles and like Promethea and Hellblazer. All those comics had lots and lots of deep esoteric knowledge in them. And wherever there's a, an appropriate avenue, like the expression of the esoteric, it will find its voice and it will find avenues to express itself whatever those avatars are and i think podcasts are very different from a lot of other content forms that we are exposed to that are available to us in the moment and i'll explain why i think they're different firstly i think most of us our attention spans have been destroyed right you know we have no scarcity of stimuli and i think that's difficult for us to process right Mm -hmm. you know it's almost like we're kind of not supposed to have access to everything where we're we struggle with that right Mm -hmm. we flit from thing to thing where we don't really commit to much i like for me to sit down and watch a movie that takes some time you know yeah and if you watch people now even watch a tv show they're like they'll watch whatever show they're on their phone while they're watching the show. Concentration is not something that we have a particular forte for at the moment. We The environment has shifted so much. We've got so much stimuli that it's very hard for us to kind of sit down and focus on something. Yep. It's not impossible, but yeah. you talk to people. Even when you talk to people, they're like, mm-hmm, yeah, okay. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. Or you, you can you know, see. You can, phone. Yeah, you can see they're thinking of totally. going it to their all phone. The time. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So that's a challenge. And podcasts, I find quite different in the sense that they're very similar to obviously, you know, by the nature of of the format, they're very similar to radio. However, the difference is you can self curate exactly what you'd want to listen to. And the second thing which you pointed out is the, the length of time. I don't have to sit there and solely commit to just you know close my eyes and listen to a podcast i can potter around do whatever i want to do i can work and whatever i want to do but it's long form content and i don't know anything else that i consume as regularly with that type of long form content and equally it has a big user base and it's a growing user base people enjoy it people enjoy listening to it so i think it's at the moment it's one of those things that it's very available to people in terms of the nature of life at the moment Mm -hmm. you know you you can drop it and pick it up whatever it is but it's a solitary thing i think it's something that people can do a lot alone um long form content which means you can also describe complex ideas and explore complex ideas with people as we are doing today Mm -hmm. you know the medium it gives the space for that which is wonderful we were all programmed growing up 
with the TV clock. You know, I used to work in the television aspect of the corporate world. And I remember having that clock where it's like the 14 minute mark, and then you have to put the commercial in. And I just remember staring at that and thinking that raised me (laughs) because I was raised by a single mother. I've been Mm -hmm. programmed with that. And it's refreshing to listen to a podcast where I don't have that abrupt break where I have to then shift my mind to a commercial. I don't miss that aspect of it. When you're listening to a podcast, especially three hours, if you're listening to something that you are interested in, when you touched upon where you can curate your Mm -hmm. own radio stations. And that is another thing that I love. You can pick the stories that speak to you. And a lot of the times that's how I come across this information. That's how I came across Mm -hmm your podcast was you were talking about the gin and we'll that's a little teaser we'll get into that in a minute but there's one more slide here that i want to go into that i'll give you an example of something that's carried over and that we use every day um even to this day something that was a tradition it was a chinese tradition and this slide here has to do with water. And and I go into water a lot in the paper and how Mm -hmm. it can be used as portals. But since we're talking about terraforming, I'm going to stay along Mm -hmm. that subject line. And this is how the archetype of the predator can terraform our human vessel. And I'm going to read from Faces in the Smoke. This is from page four, chapter one. And it's Jersey talks about quantum physics and it's going to go along with the information that I have here on Dr. Emoto. He's the guy that took pictures of the water crystals, right? He took water bottles, wrapped messages around them, and then took pictures of the crystals. He proposed that water is able to respond to human emotion, thoughts, words, and written messages. And the pictures that I have here are what the crystals look like when there's positive words and negative words. So this comes from Dr. Emoto's book is The Hidden Messages in Water, if anybody's interested in it. And I can put that in the description as well. But liquids have a memory that hold information. And this is the photographic proof of that. The archetype of the predator understands that we as human beings are 55 to 60% water, depending on the fat content within your body. And it understands that when it whispers stuff in our ears, it can change our cells to look either really beautiful or flat out nasty like sludge. And I talk about in the paper how it understands an advanced form of behavioral science. And this is a visual example of what I believe it's doing when it is using almost a parasitical type of entity coming through and interacting with us. Now, our ancestors understood this, okay? And this is where I get this from um, Jersey's book. So page four, chapter one, he puts, quantum physicists have recently confirmed that liquids have a memory that may hold information, but peoples of tradition, like the Dogons of Africa, have known this since the dawn of their existence. They call this phenomenon the memory of water. For them, water that has been part of a ritual continues to hold the magic of the ritual. Anyone who uses it will continue to get the benefits of the ritual. And then he says, how does that differ from the holy water consecrated by a priest that Roman Catholics use for baptism and for making the sign of the cross when they enter a church? It's the same thing. Uh, And then long ago, the Chinese too believed in the memory of liquids. Before drinking, they would stare at their drink, impregnating it with the power of their thought or wish. The sound of clinking glasses was supposed to chase away evil spirits. I didn't know that. I thought that was fascinating, which could interfere with the success of the ritual. Drinking the thought impregnated liquid was believed to imbue the entire body with that thought so that the wish would become a reality. It is from that ancient Chinese tradition that we have inherited our ritual of making a toast, which we usually perform without any idea of its potential magic. The mysterious powers that I have witnessed many times in magic healings, trances, levitation, and so on might similarly represent old abilities and knowledge that all mankind used to have, whether to contact forces outside of us or to make use of powers, psychic or otherwise, that are still within us. 
the reason why I brought all this up and I wanted to show pictures of it and then also show the different segments on this planet that understood this from different parts of the world is that I believe this gives an explanation of how predatory parasitical voices that Jerry Marzinski writes about, that's how they terraform the body to produce a product. They use these negative words that induces an emotional response that correlates to food. They juice us. You know, they're basically juicing us when they're doing all this. I, I like that. Um, I like the definition, the juices. Yeah. Um, well, you know, it's, um, I've heard the term louche be used as well. Oh, yes. For that kind of creation of negative energy or whatever it is that is the product. I think that's actually, it's a, that's a really good way of describing it. And uh, talking about the gin, one of the things that you mentioned there about whispering, the things that are said, whispering, that's one of the more famous things the gin are known for is specifically the phenomenon of was was or was was depending on the region of the world where it's described which is literally translates to the whispering of demons you know mm -hmm. which is whispering of devils and that is designed to deviate one from one's path and i i think that's what a lot of this is is about and i know the language you're using is terraforming but it, it is also it's a, a manipulation for a desired effect and most major religions in not in, not in their modern forms which are fairly saccharine um are very much ensconced where where ensconced in that world this was that this was a real thing mm -hmm. that there there were um spirits that would uh, deliberately look to twist people up for their own means it, within christianity was obsession mm -hmm. uh, that was the language used it's it's extraordinary really and I think more and more about it comes back to that idea of duality that makes sense in a very broad way. In the individual sense, we have that kind of horror of realizing, well, we're not top of the food chain. And as human beings, it's been a very long time since we haven't been top of the food chain because we've eradicated most things that would have been preying on us and using us mm -hmm. for food. But this is something in a sense that I think we're broadly in denial about as a society, much like as you framed our worldview is led by science, but it's led by science in a kind of schizophrenic way because mm -hmm. we have the different disciplines within science. So broadly speaking, you've got physics, chemistry, biology, mm -hmm. right? You look at physics and even as Jersey mentioned back then, quantum physics, um, entanglement, you know, all the kind of strange, odd, mind-bending conclusions that people have come to trying to work through what's happening at a quantum level. And equally, you've got great minds like David Bohm been talking about um, uh, the holographic model of the universe, yeah. that everything is contained in everything. And that starts to map onto kind of metaphysical thinking of as above, so below and all that kind of stuff. But there's a dislocation. You have this whole quantum physics view of the universe, which is staggering. It's out there, big time yeah. out there. Anything's possible. You know, we're solid, but we're not solid. Yeah, like all, all the probabilities are hanging yeah. out there until you acknowledge them and then it collapses yeah. down. Like mm -hmm. levels of complexity that are almost too much for a human mind to even comprehend. So we just see glimpses of it and slowly build a picture. And there's kind of that joke around, if, if you think you understand quantum physics, that means you don't understand it. Yeah, <laughs> you know? right. exactly. But, but the dislocation is, is that you go to chemistry and you go to biology and they have not got an equivalent, right? Normally you kind of, you filter through, starting with physics through to chemistry and through to biology, yeah. but they don't have an equivalent when it comes to quantum physics. They're still very much a kind of a Newtonian mm -hmm. empirical way of seeing the world. Whereas yeah. the quantum physics is out there. Yeah. So that's a big dislocation because we're always presented with science in this kind of envelope. Well, it's like science in a lot of ways, depending on the discipline, are saying the universe is different in very, very different ways. You know, mm -hmm. biology will kind of infer the human body is, is, is a giant meat clock. You know, mm -hmm. it's a complex machine, et cetera, et cetera. You go to quantum physics and then everything's possible, particularly 
dependent on kind of what philosophy you look at. Yes. You know, like um, you look at David Baum's The Theory of Implicit Wholeness, mm -hmm. Implicit Wholeness, then that's that provides the platform for the holographic theory of the universe, which means... Am I allowed to swear? Yes. Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, then fucking anything's possible. <laughs> <laughs> You know, like that, yeah. that's and it's a very, very long time since I read the book on the holographic universe. Yeah, um, I, I have that behind me somewhere. And I was trying to yeah. think of I probably read it about eight years ago. That was yeah. on the first stack yeah. of books. But yeah, everybody has to read that. You know, you, oh, yeah, have, you have to come across yeah. that at some point. It's but, a wonderful um, book. Yeah. Mm. But, it, you know, I like when you said it's the as above, so below, mm. you know, as within, so without, because that's where I think we're, you know, you're talking about the different sectors of science and how mm. you were saying we are in denial, but I feel that that denial is programmed into us because they want us. And when I say they, I'm talking about the predatory archetypal forces mm -hmm. that yeah. they want us to go down that path because I have a business background. I like to look at stuff from that perspective, from a corporate perspective, as if we're a commodity. And mm -hmm. as soon as I started doing that, then I could see everything at that point. And I could see how, you know, when I say stuff like they're juicing us, and then mm -hmm. I could find the science where, oh, well, we are made up of water. And oh, if you do this, then this scientist shows that yeah. we can actually change the cells or the yeah. structure. And then you have what I call the cherry blossom uh, experiment where they programmed mice to pass fears into their offspring. And it wasn't something that was epigenetically created because the male and the female, the mother and the father, they weren't connected at all. And neither were the offspring of the father. So I'm talking about the experiment where they took a male mouse and they caused it to become afraid of the scent of cherry blossoms and then artificially inseminated the female. And then the babies, anytime they smelled cherry blossoms, they created that fear response in their brains. They could hook them up to electrodes and see it. And so there's this understanding that we're now just coming to that. I believe this predatory archetype already completely understands and has been doing these types of things with us for thousands of years, probably. It knows how to poke and prod us to produce this, like you said, this louche, mm -hmm. this emotional <coughs> juice that they then consume and inducing fears and passing that through your genetics is something that could be like a delicacy, you know, and, 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 yeah. and I even look at it as even the configurations of DNA, like my DNA is different from yours and from my neighbor, my configuration of DNA, when a specific fear is then passed through it could be a top shelf or your DNA, whenever they induce fear in it could be even higher up shelf than that. I'm talking about using the equivalent of liquors at a bar. And that's how I see the way in which this archetype works through us from the mm -hmm. individual sense. It's very good to look at the visual of yeah. that too. Yeah, it's extraordinary territory. I mean, I think the thing that's worth reflecting on for people is this occurs in nature, right? There's very similar patterns in nature. For example, in, in my garden here, ants will pick up aphids and trapes them all the way across a garden and present them to a healthy plant plant that they wouldn't have gotten near of mm -hmm. and the ant will get them there and keep keep herding them over there insect after insect after insect on a healthy plant and the aphids will do what aphids do and they will break the surface of the plant and leach out the, the juices within and in the process they secrete a thing called honeydew and it's a sweet waste product essentially mm -hmm. that the aphids generate which the ants love the ants use for food so are the aphids aware <laughs> that yeah. they're being herded? Mm -hmm. They're just doing what aphids do, but they've yeah. been presented to plants mm -hmm. and literally carted around the gardens. It annoys the shit out of me. Um, <laughs> but that's what they're, you know, this they're is programmed to do that. Exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, you know, what do you think an ant knows? What do you think an aphid knows? 
how does that behavior exist? You know, where does the knowledge come from? Is it instinct? Yeah. Well, what's instinct then? How does instinct arrive? That's an extraordinary thing to observe. And, and it's a bit of a brain twister. Look at I mean, I'm, there could be very rational explanations for it, but the pattern is very similar. When equally there's a strange type of funguses that take over insects and zombify them, mm -hmm. but they're technically dead, but they're used as bait for other insects. Mm -hmm. They make them behave in a way that destroys them. It's remarkable stuff. So there, there are analogs in, in nature, not, not necessarily kind of, um, it's, it's not always easy to overlay, overlay that into kind of the metaphysical world, hmm. but the pattern of how these things move together definitely exists in the, in the material world and exists in nature. Yeah, so, I think it's easy to transition it over to this predatory archetype because that's exactly what it's doing with us. At least it appears to, if mm -hmm. you look at it across multiple disciplines, it does appear to be using us in the way that it instinctually knows how to use it. I mean, we could look at that, the ant as, oh, it, it understands behavioral science. Well, no, it doesn't. It's just doing, mm -hmm. you know, it's just doing what it's supposed to do. And yeah. so I, there are examples where, it, at least in faces in the smoke, where he gives examples of this predatory archetype uses both the living and the dead. And one of my favorite ones that correlates to something that also happened with you is on it's chapter nine and it's page 216. This is where Dushan was in Haiti and he was working with a priest. I think it's called a Bakker. And the section of chapter nine is called using dead souls for evil purposes. So I'm going to read the full account of it because I paraphrased it, but even the paraphrasing of it was like, I think a whole page, but I'm going to read the whole thing out. And then it's going to correspond to something that happened with you in the city of Jin. Okay. This is page 215 in Haiti. One of the most sought after ingredients because of its energies is any part of the corpse of a child who died before having been baptized. Sorcerers search children's graves to appropriate their finger bones. Sometimes they even snatch the whole corpse to perform rituals to capture the soul. However, the most powerful sorcerers deal directly with the souls of the dead, hiring them to take on some action, often malevolent. I once witnessed such a search for a soul, a dreadful experience. The ceremony took place at night in a cemetery in the back country of the Arabonite region of Haiti. The meeting place was the Bakker's home fort. The members of his community were all gathered together, about 20 people whom I knew well, all dressed in white. The women and some of the men wore white scarves on their heads. The Bakker let them know I couldn't use a flashlight or any other source of light in the cemetery as the brightness would frighten away the souls and perhaps anger them. Since I was short on high sensitivity film, which would allow me to film by the light of the moon and the torches and candles that the people were carrying, I left my movie equipment inside the home fort and brought along only my tape recorder, two sets of batteries and two microphones. Although I was supposed to spend the night in the home fort, the place was far from any hotel. The Bakker advised me to drive to the cemetery, which was quite far away. Since he didn't feel like walking that night, he would ride with me. With the Bakker and four drums aboard, I drove directly to the cemetery where the community members joined us about an hour and a half later. First, a ceremony was held around the drums with dancing and chanting to induce a state of trance, preparing the believers to be possessed by the souls of those who died recently. Then carrying candles and torches, the whole group began walking between the graves. The people dressed in white, the flickering lights, the full moon, and the bright stars lent a hallucinatory atmosphere to the setting. Leading the procession was the Bakker, who was chanting incantations that the crowd repeated in chorus. He addressed the souls, calling on them to manifest themselves in the believers who were ready to be possessed. According to what the Bakker told me, when the soul of a deceased person accepts his deal, 
it will do whatever he wants it to do for the whole time of the agreement, from helping him with ceremonies of black magic to increasing the powers of the Bakker's protective talismans, from annoying someone to bringing a person's illness or death. In exchange, the Bakker will provide the soul with people who are ready to be possessed by it so that it can fulfill its earthly passions. Now, a sorcerer dealing with souls of the dead has the power to force the soul to stick with the deal. Only when the time of this agreement is over will he release the soul and perform the necessary rituals to speed it on its journey into the hereafter. Now, I'm going to skip forward. Okay, so at one point, I skipped a paragraph. So at one point, I was standing next to the Bakker recording his conversation with the soul that had been incarnated in a woman. As they were about to agree on a deal, a woman standing opposite me became possessed in her turn and in a frenzy pushed away the people around her and fell upon me. Since I was using one of my hands to carry the microphone boom, I had only one hand free to protect my tape recorder, which was hanging on my chest and push her away. I began moving backward, hoping that someone would stop her. By this time, she was spitting on me, her wild eyed face covered with sweat and distorted with hatred and anger. Then she began insulting me, not in the soft voice of a woman, but in the deep voice of a man. A few people tried to grab her, but her strength was too great. And backing away, I stumbled and fell back. She tried to get on top of me. I let go of the boom and with my two hands grabbed her throat and squeezed it while keeping my arm stretched out to keep her from hitting my face. Some of the believers finally managed to grab her firmly and began moving her away from me. I released her throat and she burst out laughing. I froze because her laughter had such a strong masculine tone to it. And in a deep man's voice, she began insulting me again and telling me things I couldn't understand. While the Hong Grant, Hong, I don't know how to say that word. I'm not going to butcher it. H-O-U-N-G-A-N calmed her. Some of the crowd helped me stand up. Now he's, I love this part. He put, I had fought pirates, escaped from wild animals, survived fierce tribesmen and faced the worst dangers imaginable, but I had never been attacked by the soul of a dead person. My legs were like cotton and I was shaking all over. I needed a cigarette. So he goes back to his car, has a cigarette, realizes, hell no, I'm done with this, drives 250 miles to Port-au-Prince where he has to do shots for the rest of the night. He's so completely and utterly traumatized by this. I mean, I just love that paragraph, how look at all those things he's faced, but he's afraid of this most of all. All right. That's pretty compelling. The next day he wakes up, he goes to this tape recorder. It's not working. So he realizes that it's damaged. He has to take it to a technician in New York. I'm going to skip ahead. The technician, after he fixes it, he comes to two rationalizations. The only two rational explanations for this business, he concluded, are that someone mistakenly connected an electrical source to the microphone's inputs or that lightning, freaking lightning, hit the microphones themselves. In that case, your microphones would be burned out too. They tested the microphones and they were burned out. That was his explanation. And, you know, Gersey says he didn't have the heart to tell him that it was a woman possessed by the soul of a dead man who attacked me and laughed and screamed into my microphones. That is what it was. It wasn't lightning. I had to put that in the paper because that's insane. I love it when we have something that characterizes paranormal, metaphysical, supernatural, and then a person that's more science-based, somebody doesn't know anything about what happened and is like, oh, these are the only two explanations, lightning and electricity shorting it out, which mm -hmm. none of them happen. I love when stuff like that occurs and it's documented. And what are your thoughts considering you understand all the technical yeah. side of it? Yeah. I, I mean, well, firstly, you know, uh, Dushan taking multiple batteries and that kind of stuff to a shoot. Yeah. Very sensible. Everything, everything fails at some stage. What is particularly interesting about this is, oh, I mean, you know, beyond the, the event itself, it's the catastrophic technical failure. Now, while you were reading that, I managed to dig out the original uh, repair invoice from, from when my camera got fried. 
And just to give some background, I was off to India in 2016. I been to India multiple times I've been back again since um it was a happy happy filming ground for me I love shooting in India and was going back in 2016 to research or shoot the sites associated with the gin mm-hmm. in a particular travel book called City of Gins uh, by William Dalrymple one of my favorite authors he's kind of a travel historian he's a traveler just great travel logs but is also a historian a super super author so I was going back to see, uh, shoot these sites. And at the time, I was doing a lot of astrophotography. I could set up my camera in my room, a big kind of dormer window, so I could open my windows and shoot the sky. And I was looking for meteors and all that kind of stuff. It was good fun. Anyway, one morning, uh, I checked my camera. This is, this is a camera, it's not a year old. And bearing in mind, I know what I'm doing with cameras. right? Yeah. And... I noticed something moving across the screen when I was playing back the time lapse. I was like, that's really strange. It's odd. Sometimes when you see a sped up footage of an insect on something, the way it kind of moves across the screen. Oh, okay, I gotcha. Right. Yeah, it's so like, like a trail. Like, like it's yeah. like a trail. Yeah. Yeah. So it looked very similar to that. Mm-hmm. Um, Taught nothing. I was check my lenses. Had a look in the mirror. Nothing notable. Shoot again. A couple of nights later. Basically, I'm trying to catch a particular meteor shower, and same thing I'm like that's really strange anyway take a couple of frames it's fine but it's coming up to my trip part of my ritual before i go on any of my like my travel shoots is to get my kit pro cleaned everything pro cleaned mm-hmm. right nothing is worse than turning up in some place it's hard to get to it's difficult to find the subject matter you take the shots and then you find out your lens is dirty or your sensor is dirty on your camera. Yeah, like right. everything's so, ruined at that point, right? Yeah. yeah. So yeah, this this is basic fundamentals. Is your yeah. kit working? You know, mm-hmm. like, uh, which is to the point, two shots bring in two batteries, right? Yes. One yes. fails, you got a backup. That's your standard, right? You bring multiple versions of what you have. When I'm out shooting, I have a secondary lens. Sometimes I'd have a second camera. Yeah, you know, multiple batteries, memory cards, all that kind of stuff. I mean, the kits change quite a lot now since I should, used to shoot, but you have backups. The principles are the same. Anyway, so do my ritual before I go on this trip, bringing all my kit in to get a pro clean. Mainly my camera body. You want to get the sensor cleaned on that. That's where the real dust issues come up. So drop it in regular clean it's about i think it was about like 80 quid something like that go back the next day and the technician is like um so i spent a long time cleaning this and it cleans off and then whatever it is comes back can you leave it with me another day and i'll get it sorted yeah I'm like, okay great come back the next day he's like i can't clean this i don't i don't know what's wrong he points me to another technician this is the technician that the techies use, you know, um, take it to them and they have for a week. At this time, my flight is ticking down. I'm a week away from when I'm flying to India mm-hmm. and yeah, I called them and I'm reading it now. Here is it. Um, it's supposed to be a CCD clean, right? Deep, deep clean. It says it's really bad. Maybe mirror needs replacing, right? So, and that would have cost basic i mean it cost me it would have cost me about a thousand pounds to so it's to like almost one. the cost of the camera you might as well just get a it, new camera right it was close to that yeah okay yeah and this camera's less than a year old right wow it be good for several years now just some context i need to give to this is uh-huh. that before i was going to before i was going to shoot this story you know the back of my mind i was kind of faintly aware of what the gin were kind of a thing right mm-hmm. you know what they were I was kind of reading an awful lot about magic and witchcraft and all that kind of stuff around that time, long before, right? So it wasn't a total newbie to the esoteric world or metaphysics. Was this before you started doing all those shows? Because that's how I found you was all the shows on the gym. Was that before or after? It was before. Okay. Was before I was okay. in those shows, right? Um, so, but I'd done kind of work on the Agori and that kind of stuff beforehand. Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> um, but... I had a dream and in the dream I was in India I was in a 
a shrine of some description. I would later find out it is one of the places I was going to visit. Yeah. Uh, one of the sites in Dalrymple's book, a very famous Sufi shrine, uh, one of the preeminent Sufi shrine in India of Nizamuddin Darg Ard Alia in Old Delhi. And I was sitting on the ground and there was a Sufi performance. A Sufi, like, I think it's, um, I can't remember the exact word for um, the type of Sufi singing, but if anyone's ever listened to Nusfari Ali Khan, that's what it is. It's uh, because of the cue. I can't remember the exact, the exact word. It's a very okay. vibrant, passionate singing. It's wonderful, mm -hmm. wonderful. I was at one of those performances in this site, which used to happen every Thursday night. I've subsequently found it. And I, I'm kind of sitting on the ground in amongst the, the attendees. And I look to my left and there's a figure with his head, back of his head to me, with a white, a white hat of some description, like a turban or a skull cap or something. Mm -hmm. And it turns and looks at me. And as it turns and looks at me, its face is decomposed, right? It's like a, a rotten face to the point where it has a snake come out of one eye and in the other, right? Like Indiana so like, Jones. Know, real Indiana Jones yeah. stuff, right? <laughs> uh, and then it says to me, don't come here. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And this is about, <laughs> I'm about two weeks away from this yes. trip. And then in a matter of days, my camera has this catastrophic break. You have the dream before the camera. Yeah. Ugh. And I don't want to make it out like I just brushed that off. I, yeah. I didn't. Yeah. You know, yeah. I was truly troubled by it. Oh, you know, yeah. I was truly troubled going like, okay. Uh, yeah, that would have freaked know. me out. Were your flights and everything, was, everything was oh, already yeah, everything booked. Oh, yeah, everything was booked. Yeah, it was already booked. Yeah, that you would know. be a hard call. It was, okay. it was tough. It was tough. You I'm know, intrigued, I'm, but now I'm mm. afraid. <laughs> yeah, totally. I'm like... Yeah, I'm kind of bricking it now. Yeah. <laughs> um, but I, I I parked it, right? I just I just parked it. I kind of okay. Well, I, you know, maybe it's just a dream, right? You know, yeah. sometimes dreams just dreams. You know, I'm talking about it. What <laughs> five years later? <laughs> yes. Maybe it was something. Yeah. Uh, or, but but um. Oh so God. yeah, then that then in the subsequent week, my camera is completely screwed. Right. So I have a dream saying, don't come here. My principal tool that I was to take mm -hmm. there is completely screwed. Then a friend of mine kind of bails me out. I let him know what's happened. And he, he sells me his old camera. Right. It's an upgrade uh, from my one that broke secondhand. But I got kit now. I, mm -hmm. I, I've, I've got kit. I can go. So now you have this eerie thing telling you not mm -hmm. to go this, this warning. And yeah. then you have this person give you a camera yeah. and it's like that balance of you should go, but you should be leery at the same yeah, time. Yeah, I mean, the, the whole trip was really challenging. It was really challenging. And bearing in mind, I'm not a newbie traveler. The year before I was in Kosovo shooting Sufi story in post-war countries that have some challenges, navigated that fine. I spent six months in India a couple of years before then being in for colonies, shooting with the Aghori, you know, who in effect would have been very similar to the people that Duchamp was describing. Because like in some of my work, you'll see three skulls on a table or on a shelf. Not these skulls, actually, these skulls behind me are, are they're local to where I am. <laughs> uh, but it, those skulls were marked up in a way that the soul of the individual was deemed to be trapped within and would be yeah. used by the mm -hmm. sadhu for whatever he wanted them to do mm -hmm. you know so very similar kind of areas but this this was different because this kind of like i i was just on i was on shifting sand from the outset and when we flew to delhi my father came with me because i've been on a lot of these trips and he wanted to come with me for, for one his tooth broke in the air in the airport before we even got on the flight his tooth broke so he was in agony the whole way through I had to, we had to change hotel like three times in two days. It was just like we just landed on our knees, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, Jeez. in Delhi. It was, a, it was a tough trip. But people have challenges in Delhi all the time. Depending on where you go, it, it can be a difficult city. But I stayed in Delhi so many times. I know it pretty well. Yeah. You know, uh, what I'm trying to say is that I didn't just rock up into India. I'm like, hey, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> wow. <laughs> you know, like I didn't have a clue what I was doing. Oh, yeah. Um, and that's and, uh, good considering mm -hmm. all the things that were happening to you yeah. as you're mm -hmm. as you're trying yeah, to yeah. get there. It was it was really difficult. It was like an adventure before the adventure. 
in a yeah city. yeah yeah um, it, it was it was next it was an extraordinary place it was almost as if the place was testing you it's like if you really want to come here you've got to prove it because it, it puts you through all these different these different barriers and you just kept crossing them and then by the time you get there it's like well shit i guess this guy's coming whether we try and stop yeah. him or not at this point well i yeah i mean <laughs> you don't come out unscathed in any of these things you know it's like if you step into the ring with this kind of stuff you're going to get hit yeah. <laughs> that's just the way it is you know yeah. and when i realized that my dream was something real when i realized it was something potent is when i was making my way down through the kind of winding lanes of, of old delhi to, to nizamidian dark and then it opens up into the this beautiful marble plaza and i'm like this is the place of my dream wow you know so i arrived there and i was just like yep this is it and i was really unnerved i, I was on edge the whole trip anyway i just yeah. kind of i was just unsettled it you almost had this foretelling of something i probably would have been freaked out well it gets even worse because what happened was i was working with a young kashmiri photographer who was helping me and acting as a, like fixer and translator for me and he was talking to the, the peer who was the hereditary caretakers of the shrine okay. sufis and kind of broadly explained this guy's interested in photographing areas around the gin what can you tell him about it and it pointed to um kind of a jalabi screen which is of a carved marble lattice right and um and in behind the in behind the screen there was, there was kind of people lying down and kind of sitting there with their heads in their hands i said Th those are the people with gin problems gin and spirit problems they're in there All right so i got to take a quick photograph mm -hmm. and trying to be respectful but i still, still want to get the image for the story and who looks at me but there's kind of a, a kind of a middle-aged man in a white hat I, he's staring at me and he's looking at me and he's he's just kind of got this really intense staring at me and he's giving it kind of a lot of this you know i can see you i don't know what he's saying but he's uh, i know it's not good right yeah you know and he's like eyeballing me and kind of laugh mm -hmm. manically and, and and i i i froze i was just like fuck yeah um you know and i don't really like when i'm taking photographs I don't really feel much, right? I've taken photographs different. So I've taken photographs of like brain autopsies and like the agories I mentioned, the guys drink whiskey out of skulls, like cremations. I've taken photographs in, in areas that people might find emotionally difficult or jarring. I don't really, it doesn't really affect me, you know? And that's not, not saying that I'm dead inside, you yeah, know. Yeah, uh, and that to show that this really affected you and that's it, not It really normal. affected me yeah. because most of the time when I'm, when I'm there, I'm really focused on what I am doing. That's, that's what I mean. Project. I'm like, like mm -hmm. it, I, I normally that what I'm seeing doesn't really get through to me. The camera is a real barrier to that, right? Mm -hmm. Because I'm focusing on what I'm observing through the camera. And am I getting the right exposure? Am yeah. I getting you're the all business image? when you're doing it. So you're not 100%. allowing that aspect exactly of, yeah. of yeah. the environment to kind of, yeah. uh, you know, dissuade you in, in a certain way. Right. But this guy was like, you know, you had that dream, you see mm -hmm. it's real. And then you see this guy. Yeah, yeah, totally. You know, and so again, could any of this stand up, you know, in court? No, not at all. No. But to me, yeah. it did, you yes. know, um, and I, you know, I, I really struggled to take that photograph because I, did, I was like, what, what's this photograph going to cost me? Yeah. I've already had a broken camera. I've had a nightmare trip. I've, yeah. everything Dad lost a me, tooth. Is, yeah, I mean, it's like, you know, like <laughs> yeah. so many challenges, right? Mm -hmm. And like other family difficulties happening as well. <laughs> so it, it all kicking off. And then, you know, I see this individual in the white hat in the place I dreamt of where I saw a rotting corpse with a white hat tell me not to come here. Yes. So it's it all kind of it's this confluence points where I'm there kind of holding my camera and mm -hmm. I'm like, I don't know if I should take this. Yeah. I, I... These types of synchronicities, they really are for the individual. And unless you've had exactly. similar synchronicities, you almost can't appreciate it. And so you took a picture of this man. Yeah. Did the picture come out? Yeah, I'll send you the link now. Um yeah, no, it, it did come out. Uh, it wasn't all fuzzy or distorted. It, no, it he's, really he's, came through. 
but he stopped as I said he was kind of staring at me really intensely and kind of laughed yeah. manically and like give me a kind of a real menacing look it's almost like the gin that was trying to prevent you from coming there used him as a puppet and was Whoa, like I, mean, yeah. I can see you yeah. you know you came <laughs> I'll post this in your in the chat here it's the last image in the gallery all right this one That's him. That's him. Yeah. So he was staring at you as you came in. Yeah. Oh wow. And what's this lady doing laying down? She's somebody She's that's prone. conflicted, and then there's another yeah. person laying there. Yeah. Wow. They come mm. here to get the Treatment. gin taken out. Is that it's yeah. an exorcist? This is pretty a much. place for where they do exorcisms. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, pretty much. Wow. Mm. And there's a guy over there. So there's another room. Mm. So there's yeah. just these rooms all over. Yeah, they're actually called jolly screens. I call it Jalabi, and Jalabi's a sweet. <laughs> See, I thought it was this guy. No, it was he's the he's the water uh, the water guy, the water walla. Gotcha. All right. Wow. So these are. Oh, look at this place. This is fascinating. Where was this guy? Was he in one of these rooms over here? Yeah, actually, he stopped there. So you see this guy in the foreground in the bottom the bottom right of the shot? Yeah, right here? Yeah, just above him. Uh -huh. see, the, see the white marble? Yeah. In there. They were in there. Okay, so they keep them separate from the main yeah. part. Okay. Yeah. So on the, on the left side of the screen is one of the tombs. The dome in the back is Nizamuddin's tomb. Okay, I gotcha. And then yeah. do they do the exorcisms out in the open or do they take them in another room? I don't know. They didn't tell me. Okay. What's that? Uh, this is an iron chain. This is at a different shrine. A lot of the times they use the knots, not magic, as a kind of a promise, right? Okay. So it signifies an agreement. You'll see the same thing with padlocks. Yes. Um, it exists in the West as well. You'll often yeah. see kind of young couples putting padlocks on bridges with their initials mm -hmm. on it. It's like it's like our love is locked together, right? We're locked yes. together, that kind of thing. It's a similar thing. However, kind of within this particular shrine, if you go back a couple of other shots, you'll find somebody holding a chain. The green cloth is sacred Sufi cloth. There's another one, yeah. This one? Yeah. That pot, that pot contains a gin. Oh, this one right here? Yeah. Ooh. Okay. You probably don't want to touch anything here, right? No, no. I'm, I would be uh, so, I would be gingerly stepping over everything. So this particular shrine is called um, Kawaja Mudin Krishti. And this is in the middle of Delhi's Ridge Forest, which is kind of a, a beautiful okay. park in the middle of it. That chain is quite significant. This one right here. Okay. Yeah. It looks uh, like it's at the doorway. It's exactly at the doorway. Okay. Basically, that's to determine if someone's possessed or not. <gasps> so you have to touch it? Yeah. Do you, do you so have to touch it? I touched it straight away and can happily confirm I am not possessed. Okay, well, what the heck uh, happens? It's iron. So I it's know, iron. But, oh, so you're supposed to, it's supposed to burn you or be it's, sensitive so to the your iron, touch. Yeah, okay. iron is repellent to gin. And the whole point of it is the two, there's two, there's two tests here. One is the, the iron. The second is stepping across the threshold into a sacred Sufi shrine. Okay. It would be like a place that is is within the domain of, of the sacred, and gotcha. therefore something evil cannot pass okay, the so threshold. So it's protected the threshold, the whole Correct. entire plaza, yeah. and then this chain is mm -hmm. wow. It's used to establish is it jinn, um, and at that process they would start the treatment of exorcism. Okay. Treatments. So those people treatments. that were in that other room probably touched this and they had a reaction. Well, this to is it. a different shrine. This is. A oh, different okay. One. Okay. Yeah. yeah, but probably there was an equivalent process. Excellent. Oh, this is so fascinating. I'm so glad that you are sharing these. But the the pot you saw earlier, that clay pot. Yes, the one that was in a, the, a, that was in the woods. Yeah, it's called mm -hmm. a, a makla, if I remember correctly. That's where the whole thing of genie in a bottle comes from. Yes. So that's where how they're, they're trapped into those bowls. Mm -hmm. You know, um, Regina in a bottle. That's literally this, this literally what that is. What is is this a burial? Yes. Okay. So that's it's like the, a funeral. It's like the, the funeral rites. Yep. The funeral rites. Okay. This is the no. This these long dead. It's a couple of hundred years in the ground there. I think. Um, okay. So this is. This is just, it's it's attended to by his, uh, the ancestral caretaker uh, of the shrine. 
if you look on the ground there, you can see there's a kind of a chintzy welcome mat as well, which I always kind of <laughs> made me laugh a little bit. That's yeah. cute. Mm. AC unit. Mm. Nice. Okay. And this is just another angle of it. Correct. Okay. Yeah. Gotcha. And now is this where that, the funeral or I'm sorry, the graves. Yeah. Where, this is where the grave was. Okay. Yeah. And then at the front here, you can see the, these white graves are uh, graves kind of the, the subsequent successor um caretakers uh, sufi okay. caretakers would be and this is probably at the entrance this is actually there's there's, there's several different shrines in it there's several different locations okay. so this is uh with, the problem is we're starting at the actual back and we're going back yeah uh, i just started flipping and, through it yeah, i'm sorry that's, I'm just that's all right no worries by them. this is uh, this is from a different area called um for shah kotla Okay. Um, which, and what is this that we're looking at the right end? What you're looking at is um, this is a gate to one of the grottos that make up uh, for us Shokotla. What you're seeing here is a letter to the jinn. Okay. Oh, okay. The locks, again, they represent the binding of the promise. Whatever the deal is that the person is propositioning the jinn with, signifying okay. that I agree to this, it's almost like a, a countersigned contract, right? That's what the locks are. The, the letters... Uh, keep scrolling through. You'll see. Uh, you'll see more of them. The letters could could be covering anything. These are dishes of. And they put of, pictures. Um, are yeah, these they put the their people own pictures. that they want? Are these the actual people that are petitioning, or are these people? Are there other people petitioning upon their behalf, which is why they have to use the picture. Um, or both. I don't know if it, okay. whether or not they that they were the individuals or not. The okay. pictures were very frequently included. Okay. This is milk and bread that okay. have been given to the jinn. Mm -hmm. um as as uh, as gifts uh offerings rather did they explain to you the significance of milk and bread they never went into the detail as to why no. but okay. what's very interesting is fairies are often offered milk and butter yes that's true so very similar um okay. analog there which i found interesting when i attended the agori ritual he drank a, i mean literally a skull full of whiskey Oh, wow. Okay. And then this is another petition. Another letter. Okay. Yeah, another letter. To wow, the they're long. Look at that one. Yeah. And that, that was photocopied and put up on a number of different locations. Wow. These are excellent. Oh, thank you. And what's this? This so is like... inside the grotto. Okay. Uh, so you've got a little oil or ghee lamp here. Okay. And so they'll leave the lamp and the incense. You can see like flower petals and there's old sweets and stuff that they've been left out for for the jinn this particular site is not a sufi shrine it's believed to be home to ten thousand jinn okay so it's said to be the most haunted place in delhi well, did yeah. you have any experiences while you were there i nothing no nothing, nothing paranormal untoward. yeah nothing paranormal just a flash rainstorm okay. you know um now th this actual mm -hmm. pillar here is called that's called an ashkatan pillar um and that's the, the Ashkatan pillars are from the Ashkatan Empire and they are absolutely beautiful. I was going to say, you know, it looks beautiful. Yeah, yeah. And they're ancient, you know, they're really remarkable. Look at the writing on it, mm. how just it's it's perfectly straight. I mean, yeah. look at that. That's incredible. And if you go back a shot, you can see that's the citadel of uh, Farasha Kulta. Is that the pillar right there? Yes, yeah, the pillar That's, on the top. Okay, I gotcha. So the chief jinn, uh, Lat Wali Baba, is supposed to inhabit the pillar. So I wonder, did somebody have to do something to place him in there? Or is that just where he decided to go? The association with that particular area and the jinn is relatively new. I think it goes back to like the early 70s, which is very strange because it's got it's it's pretty famous now if you do any kind of ghost tour of, of delhi you will go to this site like 100 okay. <clears> percent <throat> but i met a family that girl you saw a couple of shots up um uh -huh. i was talking to her family and they were doing a two-week ritual and they were about halfway through it to a two-week ritual to the gin to petition them for whatever it was to help them and i spoke to the father and you know so well you know is it working he's like yeah it, it's already happening we're halfway through and what we want is already happening okay so, this is fascinating because when when i was first researching the gin 
it was almost as if you were to stay away from them. What I was listening to, they were coming across as demons, but these people are going and petitioning them, praying to them, asking for yeah. things. So yeah. this is where we were, we're going to kind of circle back to what we we're talking about in the beginning. We were talking about dark and light and yeah. how there's really, it's really gray whenever you get into this esoteric type of topic or these yeah. metaphysical topics, how are they looked at from their perspective? They're, are, they're not looked at as demonic, are they? Well, it's complex, right? Uh -huh. Most Muslims won't even like you saying jinn around them, right? Mm -hmm. They won't even mm -hmm. like hearing the word, right? They're like, shut up. <laughs> yeah, like, like shut you your know, mouth, like, yeah. <laughs> you know like uh, -huh. uh you know looking over their shoulders <laughs> like shut yeah. up you know that's why um, I'm, like that's why i'm questioning like i i i was in when i was first introduced mm. to this topic that's the kind of information i was getting yeah but then i'm looking that's still very much the case petitioning. okay yeah it's right. still very much the case right mm -hmm. to petition the jinn to intercede on your behalf is it's not an everyday thing Okay. No, but you got to remember, like Delhi is a city of like a, you know ten, eleven million people. So there's going to be people who will try different things. Yes. Um. So it's it is an unusual thing to do, mm -hmm. definitely. Okay. But equally, you look at people who work with Solomonic demons to mm -hmm. intercede on their behalf, you know, magicians. Yeah. And, and 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 what have you. So that's within esoteric circles would be relatively common practice for that group the, the jinn are, are they're widely feared you know and they have a they have a very bad reputation that you mm -hmm. do not mess with the jinn they're they are notoriously vindictive and vengeful that's why i'm so fascinated that these people are just petition you know they're just going there and yeah. and doing a two week that's a bit that's a lot of energy to yep. put into something. Did they even explain to you what it was that they were looking for? No. I mean, you would almost have to be at wit's end, right? To be going there. I mean, it's yeah. like, like, this is a last resort type of mm -hmm. thing. I'm desperate. I'm coming here to try this. Or if you were brought up in that tradition, then maybe mm -hmm. it's more of something you do every year. You know, well, you go it, it's interesting. Year. It's interesting you say that because we translated some of the letters, mm -hmm. right? Um, and, and it was a mix of different things, right? So we there was stuff around mothers petitioning to help their children with drug addiction, alcohol addiction. There were people just out and out kind of make me famous. You okay. know, I want to win the lottery. So it, it, it's the kind of the spread of human desire, you know, and human need. An interesting thing was said to me once in Delhi by a coach driver. Well, I was waiting for my own ride and I got chatting to this guy. He liked my trousers. He's like, where would you get those trousers? <laughs> <laughs> and we started chatting and you know, he asked me what brought me to Delhi and I explained kind of why I had traveled here for photographic work. And he just kind of very sagely said in passing, yes, all life is in India, all life. And that is, in my experience, genuinely the case. There is people living lives that are comparative to those that would have been two or three thousand years ago they haven't changed there's this poverty of a level that we can't really conceptualize for entire families and equally there's wealth that you can barely conceptualize remarkable it's remarkable like the things. full spectrum of human yeah. experience is really just is. within this area mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. i was thinking of karma as i was saying that and reincarnation you could do so much just within that sector of this planet. Oh you yeah. Could, you could cycle and go through the full spectrum mm. if you wanted mm. to and not ever leave that geographical location, which I well, think stuff like that is fascinating from a metaphysical mm. perspective. If you look mm -hmm. at it from reincarnation and they take that topic very seriously over there, which well, yeah, is also yeah. fascinating as well. India has an unbelievable contribution to the spiritual and metaphysical learning of the world. Unbelievable contribution. Oh, it is yeah. it is absolutely staggering. Um, it's in a remarkable, remarkable place. I mean, I, I love India dearly. You know, I miss it. I miss it a lot. You did a great job with the images, taking a place that would have been thought of as something that's scary mm -hmm. and 
maybe negative and it was just beautiful the way that you captured it and even the emotions of the people your stories you, you saw somebody that was mm -hmm. in a terrible state from the influence of the gin and then you mm -hmm. met this beautiful family who mm -hmm. was getting their wishes granted as they were you know they weren't even done with the process yeah. of it even your experience there you saw the mm -hmm. full spectrum of yeah. how the gin can influence us not only a, a location, but the people th and themselves. And then you were also affected by it even before you got there, mm -hmm. which goes to show almost that, you know, we'll bring this back around again to the holographic nature of this reality. Mm -hmm. You were almost there before you were even there in a sense. Yeah. 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 It's, it's, that, that's a, that's a very good reflection. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay. You've got to do more traveling so we can have more shows. <laughs> We're going to have more pictures to look at. I want to. I yeah. want to. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay. The last thing, this, this works out perfectly because the last thing that I was going to touch upon from the book is in chapter two on page 31. And I'm not going to read the whole thing, but because I think it's three pages, but it talks about the existence of magic. And this goes perfectly with everything that you were talking about. So I'll just read a little of it. I'll probably maybe just read a couple paragraphs because we're almost a couple hours into us talking and I know it's getting late for you. So I'm trying to be mindful of that, but it goes, um, the author Duchon talks about esotericism and how important magic is and the occult and esoteric things. And so I had a cousin that was visiting recently and he's younger, he's in his early twenties and he was peppering me with questions about metaphysics and occult and esoteric. And I, he was just so excited. I've never met anybody that age that's so excited about that stuff. So I was all excited too. And I said to him, if you do anything, the first thing I thought he should have done was study the occult and the esoteric because it is built into the fabric of this reality. And if you dismiss it and you don't understand it because it's involved in everything, you will miss everything. If you don't factor that in first, before you go down this journey of looking at paranormal, metaphysical, all of those things, they all have that foundation of esoteric and occult. And mm -hmm. do you agree with that? Yeah, I think so. You know, from my own personal perspective, I would argue um, it, it is important to study. You have to read mm -hmm. equally. You have to have your own practice. Now, that can happen in a number of different ways, be it with mm -hmm. groups of any description. There's plenty of online groups as well. I mean, I would treat them with the caution you treat any group with. But observe nature. Yeah. You know, when we talked about this at the start, when Dushan Gursi described, you know, um, I think he said the first cultures, he uses a particular term. Um, peoples of tradition. He always yes. calls them peoples of tradition. Yeah, yeah. peoples of tradition. They're observing nature. Right. The closer you develop a relationship with place and with nature some people will take that a step further and start communicating with the spirits of place that's what i would say in my experience is that obviously not a universal thing it's just a, a personal thing but the more you develop a sensitivity to nature the more it develops the sensitivity to you yeah there's that saying if you look into the abyss the abyss stares back yeah. You no, know, it's like be careful looking into the abyss because when you look at it, it looks at you. Mm -hmm. It's exactly what they say about the gin. You know, if you look into the gin, they look into you. And I started finding out all this stuff after I had these nightmares <laughs> and this crazy experience. And I'm like, ah. You're like, yeah, you think? <laughs> oh, oh, okay. Yes. <laughs> okay, now I get it. I got Thanks the for the crash course. Yeah, you <laughs> yeah. were like thrown to the gin wolves. And yeah. you had your sink or swim moment and you swam. I mean, so, I, got off I got off lightly though, to be yeah. honest. Mm -hmm. Again, but it, it also goes back to what we're talking about around duality and the nature of certain things. And to your point, yeah, the sink or swim, what happens? Yeah. And I look at it in a very similar way, but I use kind of different metaphors, which is yeah. if you face into it and kind of pass through it, like oh, yeah. you're often presented with a horror of mm -hmm. some description. The horror is a mask. If you can get through it, it becomes something different. I think the horror is that aspect. I call it the Wizard of Oz. 
it's the place where most people stop because yeah. they're either horrified, fascinated, they're glamored by it. And I think that's because it's the bouncer. Not everybody can come in. And if you can get past this bouncer, yep. it's almost like if you know the path, like in Constantine, when he was going to that bar and he had to look at that tarot card. And if you could telepathically see what was on the tarot card, then you could go in. They tried to scare you away from going. Mm -hmm. And then once you got past the bouncer and that experience with that guy, because it was almost like recognition of you made it. They were making contact with you. Like, we see you. <laughs> oh, yeah. It's really interesting you said that because that's exactly what I felt. You know, it's exactly what I felt. I felt I'm looking at it. I'm looking yeah. at, you know, the yeah. face of a person. He was like, good for you. Person. Good for you. You passed. Yeah. Have fun walking well, I don't know here. what he was thinking. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I'm, I'm <laughs> sure he was probably like, this guy actually came. Mm. I write about that in the paper where this predatory archetype, once it finds a swimmer, it throws a life vest to you. Right. But the rub is that it has to pull you to it. So it mm. threw that life vest to you and it pulled you to it. Literally, it pulled you to its lair mm. in a mm. sense. And then it looked at you like, I've got a live one here. I can actually work with this one. This one is still being cautious, which is important and skeptical at the same time, mm -hmm. but that's what it wants. It wants somebody that's holding those two, um, I guess, thought patterns, frequencies, because it knows yeah. it, that you're responsible with working mm -hmm. with it. So mm -hmm. that's probably, well, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but is that maybe the reason why you did all those shows on the gin because that's how you started your show, correct? Yeah, it is. It was me trying to process what happened. You know, that was my research coming out. And I read as much as I could on the gin. Probably the best book I would say out there is Legends of the Fire Spirits by Robert mm -hmm. Liebling. It's an excellent, excellent book. I'm going to put that uh, in the show description. Legends yeah, of the really what? The Fire, fire Spirits. Spirit. Okay. Fire Spirits. That's an excellent that. title. And... That was me trying to process what happens because fundamentally well, you can look <laughs> at these things from a, from a particular angle and kind of go, Oh, that was weird. Wasn't it? And just move on. Right. Yeah. And not, yeah. and I not, think most people you know, do that. Yeah. Potentially. Yeah. Potentially. Mm -hmm. I mean, to be fair, most people wouldn't have done what I, what I did. Oh right? no. It, it, no. It, it, no it, um, like there's a small group of people who would go to a completely different culture to to tell a story, to find a story. Mm -hmm. And even smaller still, that would be going in, you know, for around the subject area that I was looking at. Yeah. So it's, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's an, it's a niche thing. I'm very aware of that, but what fundamentally happened to me beyond anything else is my understanding and view of the world completely changed, you know, completely changed. And it was, you know, to be fair, it was quite a traumatic, you know, spun my head around where it's mm -hmm. like all the rules are gone all the rules are gone but it, that's a subject matter that i've always been interested in it's one that i've always been kind of experimenting with to a level but experimenting with and reading about are very different from having kind of then having it right there looking at you <laughs> yeah 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 yeah, yes, yeah. yeah. Uh, which is yeah. what i see that a particular event as but Again, you come up against the whole thing of duality because it led me to a far better place, far better place in almost every aspect of my life. And while that particular trip was difficult and equally you know, the months that followed trying to process it, because you, you get a shock of a description because when you see something that you're not supposed to, you feel you're not supposed to, something yeah. that kind of, you know, breaks your understanding of the world, be it kind of like morality, or what one would perceive as, say, the human dignity. If you see something horrific that breaks that, that you carry that for a long time. This was something that I felt that it broke my reality. It broke my understanding of the world. It didn't work anymore. Yeah, I was interested was... in these areas, but now I was like, well, I'm in them now. Yes. I'm experiencing things. Yeah, and I that was, was your catalyst for the evolutionary growth process of the mind. That was your catalyst mm -hmm. right there. You could have been the fourth person in my paper because I had three people that had very similar experiences mm. and they documented it in their books right. and see this is another reason why i'm glad i chose you 
to talk about this because we just talked about your catalyst, which was not even on the list of things <laughs> that I wanted to talk about. It worked out perfectly. We need to thank the gin for blessing us with that information. But I know we're getting towards the end. I'm going to read this section on the existence of magic. I'm cool. going to read a couple paragraphs because this will bring everything together. I was going to read something else, but this caught my eye at the last minute. And I haven't read through it. Usually I read through these things a couple of times so that I don't mess up saying certain words. I'm going to try and trust the gin energies that are around us right now because I think they wanted me to read this. As any um, consolation, Michelle, I was mispronouncing the name of the gin Satan, Iblis, for totally, quite some time. For quite some time, uh, yeah. There's about, I'd say, 30% of comments on my YouTube videos are like, Our, oh, this guy can't pronounce this goddamn name. Like, I can't like, listen to it anymore. <laughs> yeah, it's unbearable. <laughs> this is on page 31, chapter two, and it's called The Existence of Magic. I love this section. So it says, peoples of the fourth world, like a large majority of the population of the third world nations, and even many who live in more developed countries in our modern world, believe in magic. According to the Random House College Dictionary, magic is an art employing some occult form of nature. Occultism is the doctrine or study of the supernatural, magical, and so on. But the word occultism is a recent term created by a magician named Eliphas Levi in the 19th century. It refers to esotericism without the terms sacred characteristics. Thus, one must be familiar with esotericism to understand the theory on which magic is based and to understand how much of the magic may be a reality that follows principles of ancient sciences. And let's see, esotericism is a wisdom. It means the secret doctrine that reveals the mysteries of the universe. It is a synthesis of the symbols and myths of all religions and is based on self-knowledge. Know yourself and you will know the God's universe, wrote Socrates. Taking as its field of study, the symbolic common thread of religions, mythologies, initiations, and sacred sciences, Esotericism covers a whole range of disciplines, astrology, alchemy, magic, numerical science, the Kabbalah, sacred science, hermeticism, and the anthropology of the sacred, to name a few. Esoteric science is transmitted by a master to his adept to allow the adept to rediscover the ties that link him to the cosmic forces, to the superior entities of heaven and nature. It just goes on and on and on. And I'll read this one last paragraph here. In having esotericism as its cultural background, one might say that magic is the power of the word, the power of imagination, the power of thought, and the power of faith. Just on that alone, we could have done an entire show. But I thought that brought everything together. Exactly yeah. what I was saying, that it's literally the thread that weaves through everything. And if you study the esoteric aspect of these different places, that's when you really understand the foundation and the scaffolding. I follow a guy named Ross Ben. He talks about the esoteric side of America and he lives in Philadelphia and listening to him talk about what the founders did with that land there and how sacred that land was and the river that comes through and feeds into the Atlantic Ocean, how magical it is. Uh, we didn't learn that stuff in school. If I would have learned that from the beginning, a lot of these other things would have made sense to me. That's what I'm talking about when I was explaining to my cousin that if you understand the esoteric, you will understand everything else. I should caveat that with, there's limited shortcuts with that. For most, it's many, many years of study and discovery. Oh, yeah. You know, and it is, in terms of a metaphor, it's an onion. It's just layer after layer after layer. And when one learns the meaning of an esoteric symbol of some description, inevitably, when one gets a deeper understanding, you'll find that's just the surface meaning. Even though that might be the hidden meaning to the general public or people who are not interested in this area, that's just the service meaning. There's another one beneath that and another one beneath that. It's a kind of a Russian doll of meaning, mm -hmm. of huge complexity. And equally within that, that is a metaphor in itself because we're in a reality of 
enormous complexity. Very limited, you know, our human consciousness is at a really limited aperture into into that. To into, use a photography the, term. Look <laughs> at that. Never off duty. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm glad that you agreed to do this. And I'm super glad that you enjoyed the book as much as I did. And that you did the three part series that we talked about at the beginning, because hearing you read something, there's a magic in your voice, especially when it has to do with your ancestors and the part of the world where you come from, because you're from Ireland, correct? Yes. And what's the best way to contact you? or sign up for your Patreon. I suppose the easiest way to find me is just to Google my name. And that'll probably bring you to my photography site or Instagram. Both of those will take you to the Spirit Box podcast. Um, Spirit Box podcast is pretty much everywhere. Yeah, that did. The easiest ways to find me and you know, then I, social media you're only on instagram right you're not yeah, on i'm Facebook only on instagram okay. because okay, me I'm, too. I'm extraordinarily grumpy about social media yeah. <laughs> me despite the fact that it helps me in an awful lot of ways yeah. <laughs> i'm just i'm a crotchety old man yes you put up with it like yeah, i do yeah. i know yeah. it's it was something that i got into a couple years ago i went in kicking and screaming anyways but okay so <laughs> instagram so just google you and spell your name out yeah. for everybody it's um i'm gonna just give a caveat i pronounce certain letters very differently it's d a double or r d a double or or a g h i remember when we did a show just so everybody knows we did Three, did we do three shows for your spirit box or two? I can't remember now, but yeah, you did two on the Patreon and then one on one on the main on, podcast. On the main, okay, yeah. and, and that was the one that aired on YouTube. But the one we were going through the tables in my paper, and you were saying, um, it was funny because you yelled at me, you were saying 23, and I thought with your accent, I thought you were saying 30, 33, or I don't know, I messed it up, and I was like, <laughs> Where are you at? And you just gave me this look. It was so funny. I had to bring that up. And and your last name is Mason, M-A-S-O-N, yeah. correct? Okay. Yeah. Anyone can Google that. Yep. And I encourage, again, everyone to sign up for his Patreon so that you can get access to the three shows that he did on Faces in the Smoke. And I think that wraps everything up. This is a good show. And we covered a lot about this extraordinary man and this book. And I thank you again for taking the time to do this. Thank you, Michelle. It's been lovely to be on your show. And yeah, yeah real pleasure to be on this side of the microphone. Yes, that's right. That's right. Okay, well, I'm going to hit pause.